Hi, and welcome everyone to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Chris Hudspeth, MS Focus Radio Program Manager, and I am joined by Terry Walls, who will be talking to us about dietary approaches to treating MS-related symptoms. After uh, the presentation, we'll open it up for questions and comments, but now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Terry Walls is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. She is also a patient with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, which confined her to a tilt recline wheelchair for four years. Dr. Walls restored, restored her health using a diet and lifestyle program she designed specifically for her brain and now pedals her bike to work each day. She is the author of The Walls Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles. Learn more about her MS clinical trials by reaching out to her team at MS Diet Study at healthcare.uiowa.edu. Pick up copies of her research papers at terrywalls.com forward slash research papers and a one page handout for the Walls Diet at terrywalls.com diet. We're pleased to have her join us to present this important topic. Uh, Dr. Walls, thank you for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so very much. Um, so I'll start by um, giving you a PowerPoint, uh, and then we'll go over to uh, taking the Q&A. So let me get my PowerPoint up and going. Okay. And uh, we should be set here. So dietary approaches to treating uh, multiple sclerosis-related symptoms. I'm obligated to uh, go through my disclosures and financial conflict of interest. As, I, as you, probably many of you know, I have grant funding from the MS Society. I've trademarked the Walls Diet and the various Walls Diet plans uh, and uh, the Walls Protocol. I'm uh, a paid speaker for a variety of organizations and I have equity interest in Dr. Terry Walls LLC, the Walls Institute, FBB Biomed, and I own the website terrywalls.com. And though I'm gonna give you lots of great information today about diet and lifestyle, I wanna make clear I'm not creating a uh, patient-physician relationship. And I have to disclaim any liability with respect to decisions that you take based on what you learned today. Please always work with your personal medical team before implementing new dietary routines, exercise, or supplements. So my objectives today is to tell you about my, my own healing journey, uh, highlight our published research, uh, the rationale for the dietary intervention in the study that's sponsored by the MS Society, dietary approaches to treating MS-related fatigue, tell you about our next clinical trial, and then tell you how you can learn more and get more support for changing your health behaviors. So I, I always like to ask people, if you think back the last 24 hours and you add up all of the cups of vegetables that you've had, and potatoes and corn are starches, they aren't vegetables. If you cover a dinner plate so you, it's heaped high and you can't see the bottom, that's three cups. Um, and so think about that, sort of in your head, add up your cups of vegetables. So as many of you probably know, I always developed uh, symptoms uh, beginning in 2000 with leg weakness. I'd had a history of uh, dim vision in my left eye 13 years earlier. I had uh, an MRI of my brain and my spinal cord, and I had lesions in my spinal cord and one lesion in my brain abnormal spinal fluid. And so I was told that I had uh, relapsed remitting multiple sclerosis. I, um, at that time, had two very young kids. Uh, those are uh, Zach uh, and Zeb. 
And so I wanted to treat my disease very aggressively. I sought out the best MS center I could find, which was the Cleveland Clinic. I saw their best people. I took the newest drugs. Um, and I was going continually downhill. My Cleveland Clinic docs told me about the work of uh, Lauren Cordain. I read his books, his papers, and uh, decided, and it was a big deal because I'd been a vegetarian for 20 years, um, but I went back to eating meat because I thought the uh, scientific rationale made sense. Um, gave me up all grain, all legumes, all dairy, but I continued to decline. And the next year I needed a tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, and that's when I realized that the best medicines, the newest drugs, were likely to not stop my decline towards a bedridden and demented life. Uh, I went to reading the basic science, uh, learning about uh, the animal models of MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. I decided based on what I was reading that mitochondria were the big driver for disability in MS and began taking a variety of supplements to support my mitochondria. By the summer of 07, I was so weak, I could not sit up in a regular chair. I was beginning to have more trouble with brain fog. I also have trigeminal neuralgia, electrical face pains that were becoming more frequent, more severe, and much more difficult to turn off. I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine uh, that summer, and I took their course on neuroprotection, and I really loved that they were so focused on mitochondria and that they had this insight that we have genes from our parents, mom and dad, that interact with our lifetime exposure uh, and our lifetime exposures to sleep, exercise, nutrition, stress, social networks, physical trauma, psychological trauma, our microbes, our toxins, and all of that influences how our cells can run the chemistry of life. And if they can't run the chemistry of life properly, then we get dysfunction, the wrong chemicals get made, and we begin to have symptoms, which eventually lead to enough damage and enough symptoms that now we can make diagnoses of high blood pressure or uh, clogging of the arteries or heart disease or an autoimmune problem or multiple sclerosis. In integrating that, uh, what I learned through the ancestor health movement, what I learned through my read of the basic science, what I learned now through functional medicine, and I really focused on exercise and nutrition. Uh, and that also, uh, to some degree, I went back to adding daily meditation. And as many of you know, I went from at one year struggling to sit up, needing a tilt recline wheelchair, having problems with brain fog, having increasingly severe trigeminal neuralgia, to being pain free, mentally clear steadily increasing energy. At three months, my pain was gone, my fatigue was gone, my mental clarity would greatly improved. At six months, I was beginning to walk again, working very, very closely with my physical therapist. And I, at six months, I'm on my bike for the first time in six years, and I bike around the block. My son is crying. My daughter is crying, my wife is crying, and I'm crying. And uh, if you could see my eyes now, you'd know that I'm beginning to cry now because that was miraculous then, and it still feels miraculous now. And in another four months, again, after close work with my physical therapist, I had made such improvement that I was able to do an 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. So this radically changes how I think about disease and health. It will change the way I practice medicine and it will ultimately change the type of research that I do. 
Uh, and so my uh, chief of medicine uh, gave me the task of getting a case report written up, which we did. Then he called me back and said, Terry, what, what you have done is so stunning. I want you to do a safety and feasibility study. And so he helped me uh, by getting me some mentors. And we, I, I wrote up my protocol as precisely as we could. Uh, and got it through the uh, IRB, so we had uh, approval. Then I had to go out and raise funds. And here's what that study looked like. Again, we had emulated as precisely as we could what I had done. It was a modified Paleolithic diet, targeted vitamins and supplements, a, a daily meditative practice, a home exercise program that my physical therapist had designed and electrical stimulation muscles to support that exercise program. Uh, and the diet, you guys have probably heard about this. It's uh, basically nine cups of green leafy vegetables, nine cups of sulfur rich vegetables. Pardon me, nine cups total vegetables, three cups of leafy greens, three cups of sulfur rich, three cups of colored vegetables beets, carrots, berries, a couple tablespoons of flax or hemp oil, uh, four ounces or more of animal protein. We completely excluded gluten-containing grain, dairy, and eggs. You could have gluten-free grains two servings a week. That was a pretty radical diet. And so I, I wasn't given permission to start my study until we had shown that the diet was nutritionally sound. This is a quick visual of what we're asking people to do. Greens, color, sulfur. Here's a, a, an overview of the pre-study that we had to do to show that if you implemented our diet, and we did this with recipes uh, and menus, and we also did uh, food records based on what I was eating, and what I'm comparing uh, the maroon is the average intake for a woman in my age category between 50 and 70. And the blue is following uh, my diet, uh, the Walls diet. So we were given permission to do our study. Yeah, and we enrolled 20 people. 18 had secondary progressive MS. Two had primary progressive MS. And two were men. Their disability level was between Kane and Walker uh, on average. We're able to show that people came in eating very much like the average American. One and a half servings of vegetables and fruit every day. And yes, that is what average Americans are doing. Five servings of gluten-containing grains, dairy, and eggs every day. And we radically changed their diet, and they kept that change up. Now, you only see that level of change if people uh, are experiencing symptom relief when they adopt the diet, and the symptoms come back when they go back on their previous diet. Because it's very hard for humans to give up today's pleasure for tomorrow's benefit. Our brains are very wired to crave salt, sugar, fat, inactivity, and pleasure. And it's a very big ask for anyone to give up today's pleasure for tomorrow's future benefit. This is a summary. Um, the top two lines are changes in quality of life, general health, and uh, energy levels. If you get a five-point increase, that's clinically meaningful. And we got a 16-point increase. So a dramatic improvement in quality of life for the group overall. And statistically, that's very large. Uh, less than 0 0.0005. The next change, the bottom line, is the reduction in fatigue severity. Again, if you get a uh, change in 0.5, actually it's 0.4, that's clinically meaningful. We got a change uh, reduction of 2.38. The scale goes from one to seven. 
Uh, and so this is a dramatic reduction in fatigue severity. And some of the most fatigued, disabled uh, individuals that have been studied to date. What I'm showing you here was our analysis of the uh, anxiety and depression scores. And anxiety and depression is very, very common in MS. And so anxiety declines, depression declines uh, very quickly, uh, probably as we uh, improve and reduce the inflammation. That has a, a major impact quickly. Then you see thinking ability. We have verbal and nonverbal reasoning. That improves over time, and that uh, uh, accumulates the benefit over time. And of course, we're publishing more papers. We continue to have more data uh, about the study that we're analyzing. And uh, we have so much data, we keep analyzing uh, our papers. We'll talk about uh, our, our, and we've added more studies, a randomized controlled trial uh, that is a shorter study. Instead of being a year, this is just 12 weeks. People come in, they get their baseline assessment of walking, of hand function, of thinking, uh, of mood. Uh, and then we randomize and train them on the study diet, or they're told they have to wait 12 weeks to get trained on the study diet. Uh, we give them some support, and then we call, we bring them back in 12 weeks and repeat the assessments. And again, we're able to show that the intervention group had improved mood, uh, better energy, less fatigue, better quality of life, uh, and hand function uh, had improved in that 12 weeks. Walking was um, slightly improved, but not statistically significant. And my sense of that, it uh, probably takes more time than 12 weeks to get the major function in terms of torso and leg strength, because that's a bigger muscle group. We also did a uh, weightless control comparing the ketogenic version of my diet, the Walls, uh, Walls Paleo Plus, and the modified paleo diet, which uh, is also known as Walls Paleo, uh, to weightless control. And we were able to show that, yes, people could get into ketosis, that it was safe. Uh, uh, and it, again, it's a very small group. The group that did the best was modified paleo. They were better than the ketogenic diet. But it's a, a really a small group, so I, I can't make uh, too many claims about that study other than to say that it was safe and it warrants a larger study. So we'll be writing grants to investigate that further. As you know, the MS Society funded our fourth clinical trial. We've completed all of the clinical visits. We're in the data cleaning process and working out uh, all of our covariants. Uh, we are hopeful that we will have the analysis complete and we'll be able to be uh, submitting our abstracts to the fall meeting of the American Committee on the Treatment and Research in MS. That happens uh, in September. So hopefully I'll be able to come back and tell you about that meeting sometime this later this fall or this winter. Now, many of you may have had your physician or your nutrition professional uh, push back on the Walls diet. Uh, in part, and let me explain why that may be happening. Most nutrition professionals are really trained, uh, and I completely agree, that the nutrients in our food are critical so we can do the chemistry of life properly. We are in complete agreement. And their concern is that if you exclude whole food groups, that may increase the risk of nutrient insufficiencies. And actually, I will agree with that too. What you have to do if when you're designing a diet is you need to analyze the outcome of the diet you designed to verify that your diet still provides the, nutri the nutrition that humans need. We know that we're omnivores, that when we left Africa, 
millions, of, you know, thousands, many thousands of years ago. Humans spread all across the globe. We can survive and thrive in a rainforest, in a temperate forest, uh, in woodlands, in grasslands, in deserts, in the tundra. We have a, We can eat a wide variety of things. Uh, and in general, it is a, a source of animal protein and a wide source of plant materials. And you still have to be careful about what you're eating because things there are things that are poisonous out there. And humans have solved how you design your diet in thousands of different ways. The governmental guidelines is not the only way to design a nutrient-dense diet. Our ancestors, as we moved across the globe, solved this problem in many ways. And nature rewarded those who did it successfully with more children and greater reproductive success. Now, if we want to solve this problem and you create a new diet, what you want to do is what we did uh, as we're creating these dietary rules is to do the nutritional analyses to verify that your guidelines guide people to, to consuming a nutrient-dense diet. Because I'll, I'll make very clear, and, and the science is very clear, that the standard American diet, standard Western diet, does not meet our requirements for mineral, minerals, for uh, essential fatty acids, or for key vitamins like vitamin C, vitamin A, or the B vitamins. And so we, we add in um, synthetic vitamins to our white flours because we eat so much white flour and so much sugar that we have incredibly imbalanced diets. So the standard uh, pushback is if you're not following the U.S. dietary guidelines, uh, you have a fad diet and it's a terrible diet. I agree that if you're changing your diet, you want to be sure you're following a diet that has been analyzed either because historically for thousands of generations, that diet has led to reproductive success for those clans. Or if it's a more modern diet, that someone's taken the time to do an analysis to verify that those rules let you select a diet or support you in selecting a diet that will meet the requirements of what your brain needs. So we've done that. I've, I've uh, published these three papers this last year in a high impact uh, scientific journal. So it's peer reviewed by the scientists. It's the favorite journal of the registered dietitians. We did an analysis of the Swank diet and the Walls diet and a review of the scientific rationale behind those two diets. Then we did a detailed analysis of the Swank diet using uh, menus, recipes, and a modeling process that's approved by the dietitians in the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture for analyzing diets, and we published that. And we did the same kind of rigorous analysis uh, for the modified Paleolithic diet, the diet that I advocate. And again, what we found is that our diet quality was comparable or superior to U.S. governmental guidelines, depending on which nutrient uh, we're talking about. Uh, so we have more fiber, less added sugar, and it's lower glycemic index. So you're less likely to have your blood sugar uh, get seriously elevated. You're less likely to have insulin resistance. You're less likely to be pre-diabetic or diabetic and if you are a diabetic, you are more likely to have an easier time controlling your blood sugar. So a lot of great things uh, about this diet. Uh, and so, we, again, this is a very important step that our research team and I undertook was to analyze our diet and verify its safety. And the, the other uh, good news is there's so much more recognition that, so when I went to medical school, we sort of had this naive idea that when we got the genes sequenced, we would be able to solve chronic disease. 
But now we know it's really a complicated interaction between the genes you got from mom and dad and a lifetime of environmental exposures, the foods you've eaten, your physical activity levels, your stress levels, your smoking status, your uh, exposure to air pollution, water pollution, the quality of your foods, your infections, your vitamin D levels, your hormone levels, that all of that stuff interacts with how you run the chemistry of life. And the food you eat fertilizes the microbes living in your bowels. And if these are new foods that humans haven't eaten in the last, until the last 300 years or the last 100 years, or the last 25 years, you get new and different microbes that we're not used to. And as they digest your food, help you um, make vitamins, minerals, other antioxidants, and other neurotransmitters that get into your bloodstream, those compounds help us run the chemistry of life. And they can help us in a helpful way, or they can hurt us in a harmful way. So we have much greater appreciation that humans are an ecosystem. And the more effective we are as stewards of our ecosystem, the healthier we will be. So uh, this is the paper uh, that we've done, uh, effects of our intervention on gait and balance in people with progressive MS. Um, I, well, I'm going to show, I, I can't show you this slide because I know the video does not transmit well. Um, if you down, if you go to cherrywalls.com forward slash research papers, you get access to our papers uh, and we have access to that video there. Uh, so you would be able to see this video. I am going to show you and talk you through these, uh, uh, these videos sort of broken out. This is subject three at baseline and at 12 months. Her fatigue score is 5.6. And the score is seven is total fatigue in every aspect of your life. One is no fatigue. So her fatigue drops from 5.6 to 4.4, clinically very meaningful. It takes her 127 seconds to stand up, and she struggles to get out of that chair, by the way, grab her walker, walk eight feet. She has difficulty picking up her toes. She's swinging her leg forward. You see her toes dragging along the carpet, and it's very challenging for her to walk. 127 seconds, so that's more than two minutes. And we chase her with a chair because we're nervous about her ability to walk. In 12 minutes, pardon me, in 12 months, she comes back. She easily stands up. She still needs to walk her, yes. And so you're still at risk. You still would have a hard time crossing the street because it takes her more than 27 seconds. It's, but she's much more independent. She's much safer. She can easily swing her leg forward. And now she's able to do little walks in her neighborhood, going out uh, and uh, taking a, just a, a walk down the block and back. This is subject 17. Now, at this time, there were no treatments for primary progressive MS. She's profoundly fatigued. Her fatigue score is 6.7. In just three months, her fatigue goes from 6.7 to 4.9. Dramatic change in three months. It takes her 21 seconds. You see that she's got uh, at canes, two walking sticks, one for each hand. She can get up out of the chair, walks, turns around, sits back down. When she comes back, and this is, has to do with a lot of stiffness in her legs. In three months, she comes back. She can do this with one cane at 15.3 seconds. And with no canes, her balance is not quite as good, but she's still faster than she was when she was, we saw her at baseline. She's at 17.5.
This subject uh, is one of our people who were employed. She was working part-time. Her uh, fatigue is still quite severe at 5.3. She uh, has a cane. You can see in uh, one hand there. She uses a walker when she goes to the store. She, her son is working on a graduate degree. He'll uh, graduate in May. And we're seeing her uh, in the um, uh, January, I believe. And she's thinking that she's going to have to go live in assisted living because it's really too complicated to go get groceries and do the task of daily life. And the fatigue is, is disabling, uh, making it more and more difficult to work. Plus, it's hard to drive the 15 minutes to work. In three months, now if you look closely, you'll see that her feet, she had um, like uh, jogging shoes, you know, looks like uh, tennis shoes, sorts of things on her feet and the cane. And then at three months, she has Birkenstocks, um, sandals, and there's no strap behind her heel. So she's now so confident in her foot swing that she's not gonna trip on her toes in that her sandals aren't going to slip off her feet. She can do this task, stand, walk, eight feet, turn around, come back in 8.6 seconds. If you are healthy, it would take you uh, about six seconds. She's still just a little bit slower than a healthy person. And uh, her fatigue, 5.3 has now come down to 1.4. So that's uh, very close to a healthy individual. And then at six months, the um, picture that you see with her and my research assistant, she is jumping, doing vertical jumps. And she says it'd been years since she could do that. And then the next task that she does is she jogs. Uh, and uh, it also had been years since she'd been able to do that. So when I first started doing these clinical trials, it was, I was it. No one else was doing food-based interventions. And certainly uh, then uh, Yadav, uh, BJ Yadav, started uh, doing a uh, study uh, for the McDougall diet, uh, and that was a, a diet um, uh, program. I was the first one to do diet, meditation, exercise, really a multimodal program. Uh, that, and that's because the NIH was very into funding singular, single molecular pathway studies. They wanted to learn the physiology. They wanted to know the pathophysiology. They were much less interested in health. Now, and this is in 2019, and I need to go back and update this for 2020. Uh, there have been a total of 13 dietary studies, food-based dietary studies, that have been conducted or are being conducted, and I've been involved in five of those 13. Uh, and right now we're looking at paleo diets, uh, um, salt-restricted diets, low-fat diets, ketogenic diets, fasting, calorie restriction, and gluten-free diets. Uh, and the Parkinson's looking at Mediterranean diets. Uh, the uh, Alzheimer's is looking at fasting, a Mediterranean, uh, uh, high-fat diets, ketogenic diets. So people are now getting very interested in dietary approaches. And keep in mind, I fully expect we'll find that there are many diets that are vastly superior to the standard American diet. We are omnivores. We can survive in, in deserts, rainforests, woodlands, um, uh, grasslands, uh, and the tundra. So humans can eat a lot of things and have reproductive success and have societies that, that thrive. What we have that's abundantly clear it's when you design a diet to meet our cravings, salt, sugar, and activity, 
food additives, so designed to become addictive, our health declines. Um, these are the health behavior interventions. I'm like so excited. Uh, when I was writing my grants in 2010, I got scathing reviews because of, the, of um, people didn't appreciate that studying health behaviors uh, and studying how people create health is a very powerful and important area of study. Uh, so we have more health behavior studies for MS, for Parkinson's, and for Alzheimer's. I think this is an incredibly important uh, and exciting development. Uh, the next study, I'm so excited about this study because a very important question that uh, I get asked a lot and I think about a lot is, diet and lifestyle, how does that compare to usual care, drug-based disease-modifying treatments? And we don't have any studies comparing the two. Now, I have many, 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 many thousands of followers and millions, if you count the folks who've seen the TED Talk, who contact me all the time to say they elected not to do drugs for their serious health problem and got control of their serious health problem and are doing really very well. Or they've implemented my program and improved and were able to wean and then eliminate uh, their medications. This is a, a hugely important question. And so this study has been approved by Institutional Review Board. It's being funded by private philanthropists. It's quasi-experimental, so you're not randomized. People who've been newly diagnosed within the last 12 months with relapse or remitting multiple sclerosis or clinically isolated syndrome who have been offered and decline disease-modifying treatments because they want to use diet and lifestyle. In the comparison group are, are folks also within 12 months of diagnosis who are getting disease-modifying drug treatments. Well, we were going to, uh, we were going to have people come see us uh, at the beginning and, and again at 12 months and uh, get MRIs and um, walking, motor, visual function testing. But, you know, COVID-19 happened, so we can't do in-person visits. So it's been changed to a virtual only. So you can contact us at msdietstudy at healthcare.uio.edu. I'm going to show you the study brochures. We're waiting for final approval for our study brochures that are devoted to the virtual only visits. So here's our current study brochure, which summarizes everything uh, that happens, except you will not be coming on site to do any of the motor tasks or get the MRIs or get any of the blood work. Uh, this is the new brochure that's currently under review. I anticipate that that will be approved very quickly. But of course, the usual workflow here at the university, like everywhere else in the world, is a little bit different because of COVID. So it might take us slightly longer. Still, I'm hopeful that we'll have this available to get shared uh, with the MS Focus group uh, in the next few days. So hopefully I've got you inspired that vegetables are your friend. Uh, and yes, the modern paleo diet is certainly not what our ancestors were eating thousands of years ago. But it is a way for us to think about how to get our diet more like how our DNA evolved, which is eating uh, some plant material and some animal material, with a huge diversity without sugar, without processed foods, without food additives. So again, access to the research papers and gate videos are at terrywalls.com forward slash research papers. Please reach out to us at MS Diet Study at healthcare.uio.edu. Share this with your friends. Watch our videos. Get the papers. Follow me on Instagram. Uh, if you do that, you get to see what I'm eating. We often show you pictures of my meals. I'll talk about the meals. 
I'll have a short commentary about cooking, uh, about daily life and self-care. Uh, my wife manages the Instagram account and she does a lovely job. So again, follow me uh, and you can get a one-page handout, terrywalls.com forward slash diet. Get the research papers and access to uh, the public facing video, gate video at terrywalls.com forward slash research papers. Instagram is Dr. Terry Walls. Facebook and Twitter is Terry Walls. You can have a YouTube channel. So lots of great stuff there. And I will stop my share and answer questions. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Walls. That was amazing. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're now ready for questions. If you do have a question or comment, please use the raise hand feature in the app. Click the screen. Okay. Pull you know, I, it, it, can I take, I'll take Betty's question um, oh, sure. with the looming meat shortages. So you want to be sure that you have access to protein. And so we have a couple of strategies. Uh, many of us eat met, much more protein than we really need. Um, so if you, you want to have two servings of protein, uh, two meat servings about the size of your palm or deck of cards, you could also uh, think about um, organ meat. That's a really a, a huge superfood. And there are some organ meat capsules out there that we have on our shop page um, that gets you even more effective meat than your usual meat sources. And you could use rice and beans. I would use a gluten-free grain such as uh, rice or brown rice and beans cooked in a pressure cooker. That would get you the protein. Can I walk and bike still? Yes, I uh, take my dog for a walk, uh, usually a couple times a day. Um, I would normally bike to work. It's uh, 10 miles. However, you know, I don't get to go to work at the university because we're on a work remote list, and particularly uh, everyone in the research staff. So I'm just uh, biking for a pleasure now. Okay. Um, if, if there are other questions, um, please, uh, you can either type them into the chat or use the raise your hand feature um, and click the screen to pull up the menu, select more. It's the icon with three little dots and then click raise hand. All right. Looks like we have a raised hand. Uh, unmute Kimberly. Okay. Hello, Kimberly. Hello, how are you? Thanks very I much. I am excellent. Uh, thanks for, for for putting this seminar on. It's it's a pleasure to, to listen to all of the great information. My question to you is, what has been your personal journey? Have you sort of combined the you know lifestyle and eating with medications, or did you eventually oh, sure. lean on? So um, I... Uh, I'm a professor of medicine, absolutely believed in the best drugs. Uh, I went to see the best people, took drugs, uh, the ABC drugs. I took Novantrone. I took Tizarabri. I went relentlessly downhill. I took multiple rounds of Cyamedrol, relentlessly downhill. I was uh, switched to Salcept, relentlessly downhill. I uh, implemented supplements, slowed my decline. When I quit my supplements, my fatigue was worse. I thought, wow, that was pretty interesting. Went back on my supplements, stayed on them. I, you know, added the uh, paleo diet. Didn't really seem to change my course, but I stayed with it because scientifically I thought it made sense. I didn't know how long it would take. The summer of 07, I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine, added more supplements. Uh, not a lot changed, but scientifically I thought it made sense. Then I had this really big aha like, what if I redesign my paleo diet to stress those, nutri those nutrients that was taken in supplement form? And that's when, in that very rapid time frame, in that year, I had that dramatic improvement. I went to see my neurologist, um, I think about four months into this, and I said, I really want to come off my cell set. He said, I think I, you're right. I think we should take you off. 
Uh, and so he weaned me off the cell, stepped over two weeks. He repeated my MRIs and my MRI, no uh, acute lesions, no inflammation. Um, he, was, he and I were both disappointed. I still have my lesions. And I said, you know, Terry, and of course you're still going to have your lesions. You've had them already for seven years. They weren't going to go away. The key thing is you had no new lesions, nothing inflammatory. So it's perfectly fine for us to take you off your drugs. Uh, and so we, we did that gradually. And that story is what I hear back from many, many of my um, tribe is that if they've had no acute relapses, no inflammation on their MRI, and of course it depends on their age, then their uh, physicians uh, will feel comfortable often transitioning them to a less potent drug or uh, no drug whatsoever. If you stop abruptly and you have uh, and, you, and you're still having relapses, you're still having le uh, inflammatory lesions in your brain, we would predict that you're going to have a severe, severe rebound. So this, if you're going to wean off drugs, you, you want to work with your prescribing physician. You want to know what the status of your uh, brain MRI is uh, and you know, have an honest reflection of disease activity. But again, we, we certainly hear from many, many people that their neurologist is getting much more comfortable discussing, can we transition you to a less potent drug? How do we evaluate when you could come off to a less potent drug? And then many more physicians are, are telling their patients when they first come in that whether you take drugs or not, we need to do diet and lifestyle. And you ought to think about, and they might be an advocate for the McDougal diet, or they might be an advocate for the Walls diet, the Mediterranean diet, but clearly, the standard American diet is terrible. You got to do something to improve your diet. All right. Uh, it appears we have a question from Barbara Kephart. I'm going to unmute you, Barbara, so you can ask your oh. question. Okay. I, I'm not finished yet, but um, here, hold on. Okay. Sorry. Excellent. No, no worries. I, I saw that you had a question there, so we'll... Yeah, it was just, um, I have primary progressive, I have yeah. Lyme, and I have MTHFR deficiency, uh, and I don't take any medications, but I was, yeah. I've tried, like, you know, an anti-inflammatory diet, and I've done, you know, the paleo version. I guess I kind of get confused on what actually to follow for which yeah. thing, if that makes sense. Sure. There are many authors out there that advocate uh, for their dietary perspective. Uh, as far as I know, there's really only two authors that have done any clinical research about their dietary perspectives. Walter Longer is one, and, most of, and he's done uh, research on um, uh, fast making diet. And I do research uh, on the Walls diet. So I would, as you're evaluating all this, I would look at, are people in your disease state? Have they done any research? Have they published the research? Because in order to know that your food rules actually are nutritionally sound, there's a process you can go through to verify that that diet is nutritionally sound. And I uh, highlighted that for you. I have done that. And actually, even Walter Longo, for all the great work he has done, he's not analyzed his diet for nutritional soundness for long term for the rest of your life. And he, he's done some great work. I have immense respect for him. But he hasn't, he, he, hasn't quite, he hasn't taken it to the rigor that I have. Now, certainly for... In my practice, when I'm seeing somebody with primary progressive MS, we do evaluate their nutritional status. I uh, may evaluate your food sensitivity issues. I may evaluate your toxin exposures and your current function as you are right now. So we can address a program that is very specific to your needs. 
Because while I can talk about what I recommend for the public, uh, I can't I can't design a program for that's going to fix everyone. You can design a program that will kill everyone. That's pretty easy. But you can't design a program that fixes everyone. We're all unique. So I have to be able to address your unique toxin exposures, your unique microbiome. As you already mentioned, you know that you've had exposure to Lyme. So you may have other uh, infections, co-infections that are part of that. You may have hormonal issues in terms of your estrogen, thyroid, uh, cortisol levels, uh, prolactin levels that need to be addressed. So uh, certainly, there are things that can be done to optimize all of this. And uh, you know, the other observation that I'd like to make for all of you is I have folks with genetic disorders, such as muscular dystrophy, who follow me, come to my seminar year after year after year, because what they discovered is by implementing the concepts that I teach them, they were able to stabilize their disease, improve their quality of life, uh, get s- stronger, more functional. So this guy with muscular dystrophy, in his, um, I think, early 60s, although it might be very late 50s, who is uh, planning a walking um, uh, uh, adventure, walking to Santiago, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles, I don't know, thousands of miles. Uh, and he's got that mapped out. And I'm like, you can really do that? So uh, yeah, his and his medical team are very excited about that. So he's made huge, huge uh, gains. And he has a genetic disorder. What I want to point out to everyone is, whether you have a genetic disorder or degenerative disorder or inflammatory disorder, the standard American diet is very destructive. We, we want you to have the best function possible, and that's always going to be diet and lifestyle. And it may be that just doing my book uh, and my seminar will be enough that in your primary care doc, you can get everything tuned up. Or it may be that in your circumstance, you have a much more complicated circumstance with more nuances that require uh, more investigation and a deeply personalized approach to get you the best function that is possible for you. I hope you feel inspired and hopeful. I mean, my intent is for you to feel very hopeful that uh, more improvement is possible. Okay. All right. We have a couple other questions. Uh, Let's see. Brian, you have a question. What is your question? Hi. Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay. Hi, Terry. Hey, how are you? Good. Uh, I stutter, so you have to bear with me, okay? Uh, I have a primary progressive uh, MS, and uh, I was a misdiagnosed about uh, seven years uh, because I was an alcoholic at that time, and uh, the lesions on my brain uh, mimic alcoholism, and I was never diagnosed properly. Uh, I'm having a real hard time walking. Uh, When I do, uh, my knee wants to bend over, uh, wants to bend backwards like a a bird. Uh, My fatigue is bad. Uh, I guess what I want to know is is the knee thing a normal thing? And knee bending backwards. Well, again, I have to remind people I, I can't give medical advice in this kind of context. Right. So when I hear people tell me tell me that their joints are bending in an unusual fashion that is not functional, not mm-hmm. appropriate for them, uh, likely. Uh, that's instability of the uh, ligaments around the joint and an imbalance in the muscles around the joint as well. Um, so uh, having an evaluation by a physical therapist may be very helpful. Having an evaluation uh, potentially by a either um, your primary care doc 
uh, and potentially a orthopedic uh, uh, person uh, may be helpful. Uh, it, depending on the joint and the circumstances, exercise and bracing may be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, again, depending on the joint and circumstances, there are orthotic devices uh, that can stabilize the joint. And there are some new devices uh, that are using something called uh, sort of like exoskeletons that uh, can place uh, electrodes on your skin and a exoskeleton to help you improve the, the function of your muscles uh, while providing some more stability for your joints. So the technology is evolving. Uh, for you, as I'm thinking about the primary progressive part, I, I, again, if I'm seeing somebody with a primary progressive disorder or a neurodegenerative process or really any chronic disease process, I want to work with them to address their diet and lifestyle to stop the damage, to stop the inflammation, to stop the deterioration. Um, so that's step one. And then once we've got the, the progressive damage stopped, then we can work with that person to begin the neuro rehabilitation part where we're training the brain and the muscle uh, and the connections between the brain and the muscle to work more effectively so function can improve. So there's a two-step process we put everyone through uh, with the progressive MS. We stop the damage and then we begin the rehabilitation. Thank you, Brian, for your question. We have another question from Ronald. Ronald, go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, doctor. I have a uh, primary progressive MS, yeah. and I uh, just started taking Ocrevus a year ago. Would you recommend still? Uh, not, well, hmm. so I'm not sure I, I would want to do your diet. So until I know. So ab absolutely, whether you're taking disease-modifying drugs or not, implementing a more nutrient-dense diet will be absolutely very helpful. So in uh, the leading neuroscientists are all uh, very clear that disease-modifying therapies uh, do a pretty good job of stopping acute inflammation they're not as effective at slowing uh, atrophy of the brain. They're not as effective at preventing uh, entirely uh, the risk for de earlier dementia and earlier disability. Therefore, the leading neuroscientists are telling people, you make a clinical decision about the drugs, taking the drugs or not taking the drugs. But everyone should be starting diet, meditation, getting rid of cigarettes, um, and I have an exercise program. The question of if you're on a disease-modifying drug, if you stop it abruptly, um, then you're going to be at risk at rebound. If you have, it, 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 again, there's a clinical decision about when you've been stable long enough and at what age is the correct time, and is your MRI, brain MRI stable enough that you can transition to a less potent drug or finally no drug uh, whatsoever. And that's an evolving uh, area of discussion. Uh, that's a, a long conversation uh, I have with uh, patients, uh, a long conversation that my functional uh, medicine trained neurologist and I uh, are talking about all the time is how we evaluate um, transition people who are on drugs uh, to less potent drugs uh, and to no drugs and how to do that safely. All right. Thank you so much for your question. We have one final question as we finish up from Michelle. Michelle, if you go ahead and ask your question, that would be good. Hi, Dr. Walls. Um, how do I find a functional medical physician in my area that knows about MS, or do they need to know about MS? Well, um, so wait, I have several strategies for you. One, um, you know, pick up my book, 
because in the book, I will give you suggestions on how to work with your primary care team. Uh, because uh, there's a lot of a lot you can do yourself working with your primary care team uh, in, and what I teach you in my book. So that's step number one. Yeah. You can go uh, to my website, terrywalls.com, and there's a link, uh, find a practitioner. So you'll see people who have uh, gone through and gotten trained with me. You could tell your primary care doc, you know, uh, why don't you check out Dr. Wall's training and get your primary care doc trained with me. They might, uh, and, and we're training people all the time, so that's another possibility. Uh, and you can look for um, an integrated physician or functional medicine physician in your area. You can look for IFM, that's Institute for Functional Medicine org, and see who is in your area. The, the advantage of someone uh, tra- who's been trained by, by me or getting your primary care doc to learn more about our training is that uh, I have more of an autoimmune focus and I have much more of a focus on how to help people successfully adopt and sustain behaviors. Because sometimes what happens is my integrative and functional medicine docs do a great job of diagnosing and telling you, here's the uh, steps you got wrong, what's wrong with your microbiome, and what's wrong hormonally, do this diet, take these supplements, and I'll see you in six months. And what they don't have as much training on is the science of behavior change and the science of uh, how we help people go from today's diet and lifestyle to which we're all addicted, myself included, just biologically, that's how our brains are made. Um, There's a much more comprehensive process that we've made that has 15 steps to help people go incrementally from where you're at today to successfully where you're going to be at to make this, the, these changes. Because the reasons people struggle uh, typically, and this is true whether you're a conventional doc or a integrative medicine doc, isn't that your doc told you pick the wrong diet. It's that Despite your strong desire to follow, you know, the U.S. dietary guidelines or the Mediterranean diet or the Walls diet, that you struggled with the food addictions, that, that we are so wired and so addicted to these yummy, delicious, cheap, everywhere, tasty, incredibly delicious foods that will leap into our mouth at every opportunity we need someone who can help help us get that monkey off our back. And um, I spend uh, a lot of time teaching people how to do that. And part of the reason I understand that is uh, reading, the, reading the basic science, uh, my own personal healing experience. And I ran a therapeutic lifestyle clinic at the VA where we taught these concepts uh, uh, to veterans uh, who are addicted who struggled with all sorts of addiction, and I realized that the food addictions and these other addictions are so similar that I spent more time working with the addiction specialist and with the health behavior psychologist and the nutritionist to create uh, the Wall's behavior change model, which is why we're so successful and why I, I created this training program for physicians and other health professionals to help them be more successful. Because it's, it's hard. We are addicted to, to the products that big food has made for us that are uh, everywhere and yummy and so addicting and so delicious. Yes. I'm sorry, Michelle, you had, yeah, it looked like you were wanting to. Oh, no, I was just saying thank you. Okay. You're relating to the addictions, yes. Oh, yes. Carb, <laughs> carb addiction right here. Yeah, you know, yep. it, 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 and don't feel, don't beat yourself up. Well, our brain is wired that way. Big food knows how to make products that are, are so attractive that way. It's a process, um, and that's part of what we we work out with, with folks is how to help them be more successful in dealing with those addictions. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Walls. It's it's an honor and a pleasure to have you uh, here with us today. And uh, we're, it, it was an absolute treat. Um, and, uh, it, and if anyone missed any part of this, or if you want to share this with your friends, we will uh, have a version of this on our msfocusradio.org webpage, available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page. Uh, it'll, uh, it, those will only be audio, obviously, but we'll also have it on our YouTube page. Um, and, yes, Chris, could I, could I flash up my uh, closing slide again? Absolutely. Please do. That way people will know how to find me. Yeah. So here, uh, check out our one-page handout, The Walls Diet. Get our research papers. Come follow me on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Um, a lot of great free information to help you in your healing journey. Thank you. All right. And um, also remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, for times and access information. We will have another teleconference on uh, Thursday, May 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern with pharmacist Adrian DeBerry and the topic, Beyond the Script, the Ins and Outs of Specialty Pharmacy. Our sincere thanks to everyone who attended and your participation, especially to Dr. Walls. Again, such an honor. So many more questions we could ask, but we only have so much time. Um, so thank you so much for the time, uh, and energy you put in, not to just prepare this, but also all the research you've done over the years to help the MS community. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye now. Bye, guys. Good luck to all of you.